let's talk about transition metals and crystal field theory. This is a theory that can explain why uh, there are so many colors for transition metal compounds and complexes. Let's start by talking about the electron configuration of a chromium atom. And for a chromium atom, we've got Uh, chromium is right here on the periodic table. And uh, since it was element number 24, it's going to have 24 electrons. And according to the shape of the periodic table, we've got the 1S region right here. We've got the 2S the 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and then in here, when we get to the transition metals, it starts 3d. Okay, and we can keep going. We will need to at some point. Over here, we've got the 4ps, the 5s's, the 4d's, the 5p's start with indium, element number 49, 6s, then the asterisk tells you to drop down here to the 4F region, then come back up to the 5D, 6P, 7F, 5F, 6D, and then, well, I don't have to get that far, although there are elements down here, and I should update my periodic table in the 7P region of the periodic table. Now we have 24 electrons. Uh, we'll do the electron configuration. There we go. Starts with 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, then 3s2, 3p6, and that is 18 of our electrons. We need a total of 24. According to the shape of the periodic table, our answer would be 4s2, 3D4, but it turns out that chromium atom is an exception, and that exception says the following, because of the closeness of the energy levels for the 4S and the 3D, remember the 4S energy level, N equals 4 is bigger, while the 3D is smaller, but has other 3s and 3p electrons, so it has electron electron repulsions. The take home message being that sometimes electrons move from 4s to 3d, and that's because that electron will be lower in energy. And in this particular case, it does happen, so we're going to cancel this out. Our answer is 4s1 3d5, and the reason we give for this is that the d uh, orbitals are exactly half filled and therefore slightly lower in energy that's why that electron jumps from 4s to 3d and that is the correct answer it has a 4s1 and a 3d5. Now, um, let's move on to chromium 3 plus. The rule uh, that we covered in general chemistry 1, and this is uh, all review from general chemistry 1, is that, okay, first off, we've got 3 plus. That means you're going to have to remove three electrons. You always remove the highest energy electrons first. So as we, and the highest energy electrons always have the highest number of the principal energy level. So our process here is going to be remove three electrons with the highest energy. And the highest energy electrons always have the highest value of N. where N is the principal energy level, and the highest value of N in this case is N equals four. So the 4S1 electron is going to be the first one to come out. 
We then have to take two more. When we do, we will have, uh, well, and let's do two things. We'll take away electrons and we'll use a noble gas core. If you'll remember, a noble gas core is a shorthand for the first 18 electrons of any atom with 18 or more electrons. You write square brackets with AR, because those are the 18 electrons of argon. Then we would have 4s1 is empty, 3d5, we take two electrons out of that and we get 3d3. So that is the electron configuration for the chromium 3 ion. Chromium 6 plus says take three more electrons. And in fact, chromium 6 plus, but the chromium 6 ion has the same electrons as argon. Let's run through another example. This one's going to be iron. Iron on the periodic table is right here. And 26 electrons. So 26 electrons. And with no charge, that means the atom, by the way. So 26 electrons, it will have the first 18 electrons of argon. Then it will be in the 4s area, 4s2. 3d6 is actually 26 electrons. That is the, well, let's say this. That is the electron configuration for the iron atom. You could also write it with the 3d6 and then the 4s2. Either of those are fine answers for my class. The reason to write the 3d6 first would be that the 3d6 electrons are lower in energy than the 4s2, and that might help you to remember to take them away first. Now, uh, let's draw a line there. We'll do our Se2+. plus. Se2+, plus means take two electrons away. When we take two electrons away, we are going to take, however you look at it, the n equals four electrons first, since they have the highest value of n, n equals four. So that means for Fe2+, plus, we're going to have argon, 3d6. And then for Fe3+, plus, we're going to take one more electron away, and we're going to have argon, 3d5. And from there, we can actually start placing electrons in orbitals. We'll do an example with the iron atom. Remember, we just said this. It is argon, 4s2, 3d6. That's usually how I write it, but write the 3d6 first. That's fine. And we're going to be very, so the only electrons we're going to be interested in really are going to be the d electrons as we talk about transition metal metal complexes and crystal field theory. But let's focus on the d orbital. So this will be the 3d orbital. There are five of them. And uh, when you put electrons into d orbitals, you're going to put one electron into each of them before you pair any electrons. Each electron looks like an arrow with half of a head. One, two, three, four, five. And then that's five of the electrons. We have six. I typically put it on the left-hand one, but as long as you put it in one of them, that's fine. Now let's review or uh, teach you about the difference between paramagnetic and diamagnetic. The first thing we're going to learn is that paramagnetic is, uh, you are paramagnetic or uh, you're a paramagnetic species and you are a species with at least one unpaired electron. And we can see here that iron is going to be paramagnetic with four unpaired electrons. And diamagnetic would be a species with all paired electrons. Now, um, beyond that, so paramagnetic, uh, at least in its interactions with a magnetic field, a species that is paramagnetic is attracted to a magnetic field. So 
that the day there. And a diamagnetic species is uh, repelled by a magnetic field. And that'll be helpful as we test things to see whether they're paramagnetic or diamagnetic. And while we're talking about them, let's go ahead and show you pictures of the D orbitals. These are the five D orbitals. And there is a homework question that asks you to identify each of these five D orbitals. And that's going to be actually important for this work because we're going to need to know which are higher in energy and which are lower in energy. So uh, you will also be drawing these for some of the homework questions as well. We've got DYZ pictured here, and you can see that there are four lobes. These are D orbitals, which we referenced in first semester general chemistry. Uh, now we talk a lot more about them. DYZ has four lobes. Remember, an S orbital just has one part. A P orbital has two parts or two lobes. That was P as in Paul, D as in, uh, Goodness, dynamo is uh, has four parts, or as you'll see down here for the dy dz squared one, uh, a similar level of complexity to four parts. For dyz, the four parts are in the z and the y plane between the axes. Same for dxz and dxy; they're all between the axes. And then you've got dx squared minus y squared. That's the one where the lobes are along the x and y axes. And then you have dz squared. dz squared has two lobes along the z axis and a donut shape that is uh, perpendicular to that or in the xy plane or centered on the xy plane might be a better way of putting it. And those are our five d orbitals.